Good evening, and welcome to the Allingham 2021 Poetry and Flash Fiction Awards. Uh, the Allingham Festival has had writing competitions ever since, well, at least back to 1979. Uh, in their present form, which is poetry and flash fiction, the competitions have been running for eight years. Uh, we have some distinguished alumni from the winners of the competitions. We have people who have gone on to publish poetry collections and novels. And uh, one winner is now the chair of a third level creative writing program. So uh, you're all in good company and everyone is very welcome here tonight. We received a record number of entries this year. Uh, there were over 400 entries from over 200 uh, writers and they were from all around the world as you will see a little later on. Uh, we received 317 poems uh, from 135 poets. We received 96 stories from 70 authors. And I, it's, this is probably a good point at which to mention that when these entries were judged, they were judged entirely anonymously. None of the judges had any idea who the authors actually were. Uh, to introduce our judges, I want to start by mentioning the filter judges who are the unsung heroes of, of this enterprise. Uh, I'd like to thank Neve McCabe, who is a prolific writer of short stories herself for doing the flash fiction. And I'd like to thank Michael Ray, also an accomplished poet for judging the poetry. Uh, and just a word about the awards ceremony itself. We used to do this in, the, uh, in a restaurant in Ballyshannon, which followed a lunch. Now the winners would read if they could attend and uh, the readings were usually followed by book launches. Well, obviously this year, uh, like last year, this is a virtual online event. Uh, and so we miss the food, but we do have some benefits of being able to hear more of the winners, uh, no matter where they're from, from places as far flung as Canada and Australia. Uh, we have a special treat this year to conclude the program as well. Uh, this year's final judges are two very accomplished and uh, highly acclaimed writers themselves. A poetry judge for 2021 uh, was Afric McGlinchey. She's a poet, editor, reviewer. She's based in West Cork. And many people in Ireland and elsewhere know her as a, uh, from her readings and her workshops and online courses. One of the things that, uh, uh, one, of, one of the things that's distinctive about Africa is she has some of the best titles for her collections that I've ever seen. Uh, one is the Lucky Star of Hidden Things. Another is the Ghost of the Fisher Cat. And uh, her most recent publication is titled Tied to the Wind. And we'll hear more about that in a little bit. But uh, uh, at this point, I want to at introduce Afric, who will inter she in turn will introduce our reading poets and ref uh, offer her insights on what makes their work so special. Afric? Uh, Afric, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, it's an honor and a delight to uh, have been invited to judge this competition. And uh, thanks to Michael Ray as well uh, for doing a fantastic job of uh, filtering the entries. Um, so I was curious to see what poems would emerge out of uh, the pandemic. And interestingly, I didn't see any overt lockdown themes, but uh, there were loads of walks uh, in nature or in the city. Um, and most of the poems were in the first person. There were poems about trees and horses and birds and bogs and about small moments. Uh, there were ekphrastic poems and a number about familial relationships, um, particularly elegies to fathers. And uh, several poems were about words or writing or reading. And one poem that stood out uh, described two female sculptors who invented the plaster cast to treat wounded soldiers during World War I. 
A couple of poems incorporated catalogues or instructional lists, and I found that an intriguing device. Um, like most judges, I was looking for something distinctive and different. And uh, all the short list, list of poems had something to commend them, but the three winning poems stood out because their narratives were unusual or compelling. So in third place is Sustina for Jane by A.M. Cousins. A.M. Cousins poems have appeared in literary journals, including The Stinging Fly, Poetry Ireland Review, New Irish Writing, and The Best British and Irish Poets. Her work was highly commended in the Patrick Kavanagh competition, and in 2019, her Not My Michael Fury won the Fish Poetry Award. Anne also writes memoir and local history essays, and is a, con a regular contributor to Sunday Miscellany on RTE Radio. Her first collection of poetry, Redress, was published by Revival Press in 2021. What charmed me about Sustina for Jane was the tone and the phrases, wild drunk, weans and that wee boy, which allowed me to hear the poem in a Northern accent. Um, although the form is declared in the title, the end words are subtly used and the narrative evokes not only a Northern mother's life, but also a whole culture and era. So congratulations, Anne. And um, if you would read your poem, please. On mute. You can hear me now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not a northern woman, but this was written about a northern woman. I'm a very southern, southeastern woman. <laughs> Sestina for Jane. Returning from night duty, she sidestepped sleeping forms in the sanctuary of the front room on mattresses, sleeping bags and quilts. She dipped a finger in holy water, blessed other mothers, boys and girls, united in a sacred cause, cooked soda farls and Ulster fry, a feast for brave men and women, but she considered this the business of men. Later, the door was kicked in by police in free state uniforms. She kept her mouth right tight because whatever you say, she fixed the ransacked rooms and brought the winds to school, her own sweet girls and boys, came home and slept for hours under a quilt. The homemade applique patterned quilt, a wedding gift stitched by grandmother and mother, the women who warned her to wise up to that Rathlin boy. Now he's home, wild drunk, who told the guards? Who'd inform on their own? He rants and kicks the chairs, wrecks the room. She listens. Rues the day she met him at the causeway of Finn McCool and mighty Antrim men, causing her to lose the head. She loved the bagpipes and men in kilts at the Lammas Fair, and he kissed her in the back room of her cousin's wake, bought her a dulce and yellow man. Horses cost money, and hospitality is not cheap. The bank informed him of the plan to recover costs. On one of the uncle's boys bought the house. Big Dan got the land in Armoy for a song. They packed up, moved south. No family laws to protect her then. Husband signed official forms. She saved the Japanese tea set, a painting of the Glens and the quilt. They opened a boarding house where lost young men would not be found. In one of the back bedrooms, the boys installed young Sean. He needed room for his hobbies. A great pair of hands on that wee boy could fix anything. But she wept when Birmingham was blown apart. Men and women, innocent folks, all slaughtered for a bitter old cause. Last year, she got up at 2 a.m., made dinner for dead men, spilled boiling water on her feet. The neighbours heard her and informed the family. The care units for women only because old men stray from room to room like wild, bad-mannered boys. They wrap her in her quilt. Her children sign the forms. Sistina for Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, that was, that was wonderful. Um, so in second place, is The Decision by Dara Byrne. Dara Byrne is an Irish poet living in Gadigal Land, Sydney. 
He has published in The Honest Ulsterman, The Blue Nib, Crossways Literary Magazine, The Canberra Times and Westerly among others. His poems have won prizes or been commended in a, in a number of competitions. He's recently been highly commended in the Winchester Poetry Prize and won first prize in the inaugural Rafferty's Return Arts Festival. He, uh, poetry competition. He's the convener of the Sydney Poetry Lounge, a long running open mic night. He pays his rent by writing software, which he often finds as frustrating and satisfying as writing poetry. So um, his poem, The Decision, packs an emotional punch in terms of content. In just three stanzas, the poem explores guilt, shame and secrecy, as well as a rebellious rejection of the church. Metaphor and simile are used effectively. The day itself was a tall spike that sundered the expanses of prior and since. This is a poem I kept returning to. So congratulations, Dean. And can you read your poem, please? Thank you, Africa. It's uh, really a thrill to be selected amongst the winners. So here's my poem, The Decision. When she thought of her history as a bell curve with a narrow standard deviation, the day itself was a tall spike that sundered the expanses of prior and since on an otherwise placid lifeline. That morning, the breeze blew from its bad side and flattened her hair with a first intimation that the sense of herself she had long been so sure of could be ripped from the mast of her being and flap in a gale of dissemblance. In the days immediately afterwards, she was relieved that there were few witnesses. She mended herself invisibly, stitching her tears, wearing her conscience like a favorite undershirt. As the long years ushered her through, she sometimes gave thanks that those who felt a nameless narrowing on their path, at times when they expected smoother progress, would never have known to condemn her. In her later years, when she walked past churches, she'd sensed the tug of a faith that was no longer hers. Those holy men who milk the instinct to confess, to the same ends they lid our more urgent instincts, would goad her to share her act beyond herself. She held less tightly to their notion of sin, so she clasped her decision to the hub of her breastbone and coddled it like a taciturn child until they put her in the coffin and buried them both. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful, Dara. Um, okay, so the winning poem is Diary of a Dead Eel Boy by Dean Gessie. Dean Gessie is an author and poet who has won or been placed in more than a hundred international literary competitions. He was included in the 64 Best Poets of 2018 and 19 by Black Mountain Press in North Carolina. He was also published in the 35th World Poetry Prize Anthology in Italy. Most recently, Dean won the Creators of Justice Literary Award in New York and the UN Aligned Poetry Contest in Helsinki, Finland. Dean's short story collection called Anthropocene won an Islands Book Award in Greece, the Uncollected Press Prize in Maryland, and it was runner up in the Los Angeles Book Festival competition. So Diary of a Dead Eel Boy is striking visually with its long lined couplets and minimal punctuation. The language is artful and propulsive. The rhythm and assonance, the surprising adjective noun pairings and the onomatopoeia, cluic, cluic and a wick and a wick are evocative both of Dylan Thomas and Paul Muldoon. The narrative describes a father and son out fishing, catching an eel but the poet brilliantly sidesteps a risk of sentimentality. It's a poem I wanted to read aloud repeatedly for the sheer pleasure of the sounds. Just magic, and for me, the clear winner. So congratulations, Dean, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing you read it. Thank you, Alfred. And uh, 
it's a great pleasure to be in everyone's company today. Um, so this poem is called Diary of a Dead Eel Boy. At the wane of day, my father and I would strike out small in tall rush and long shadow, greasy wellies and waders, orange and blue, through cluick, cluick, and a wick, and a wick. My father and I would navigate fruiting bodies, upright catkins, and ache-shaped leaves down to bat song air at crag point of dark and the one twisted ash and succulent grasses. Split the green curtain he did with his club fingered hand and bid me break my slipping gait with the sober refrain, care is the order, while hopping goat-like scree and rock chimney. At river's edge, we left good altitude, leaned one the other on sharp degrees waterward and entered the lair of the eel down to the killing stone mucked with bone, gut, and gill. Dark now darker on the face of father's eyes, flint knives for sacrifice and organ dissection. He ran silence through nocturnal notes and brackish molecules, blood spores in the nose. Spillers he'd take and drive the stakes like a loony railman laying bed and ties into the sea. Gather line and hook underfoot and stab a worm fat way short to make show of the ends. Out went the line and sinker straight points aft of entry and father and I bent crooked obtuse and tautness in the hands that were the sign of a true lay or untold fears coal lorry black. Behind him I stumbled hammering spare stakes tossing hooks and smelling and hearing blind and always the glup of water and kick of little owls and the dank of sulfur, salt, and nettle. Through sand and heron shit, we skittered palm reading nylon and slack for hunger and urge, shoring up spillers and skirting carbon rust of hippo tusk and macaque jaw and dung beetle. And then he bade me do that thing that was holy of holies and life for life and seed for seed, but come the shot, recoil, and treadless boots, come the slip, fall, and lumber shock at sedge bar, and bubbling hoe, and breathless he, and gasp, and pee, and neck, and ice, and skin, and smart, and entropy, and amber trilobite, and salt shad, and mud fart, and snot jelly, and black hole, and father cursing the weight of the boy, and sinkers of melted lead and iron pipe, and always the hook and the mouth and the boy's leg for anchor and bloody minutes cut into his hands until the earth gave way at the bottom of the world to the mud golem and the old mouthed oily thing wrapped long at his leg and father looking fire-eyed and hell bent at eel and eel boy and stomping spineless and clubbing pastewise the jaw, eyes, and tooth plates in its ugly face, and returning next day with the sober refrain, care is the order, and spillers, worms, and hooks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you to uh, Dean. And um, yeah, can I hand you back now to um, Tom? Thank you so much, Afric. Thank you for all of the poets and for your readings. Uh, it really brings it alive to hear poetry read. And uh, thank you. Before we go on to the flash fiction awards themselves, uh, I want to introduce Molly Keene. The Keene family of Bally Shannon uh, has long been associated with the arts. Uh, they are actors, playwrights, filmmakers, and they've created a special award uh, for the fiction writers. And uh, I would like to ask Molly to tell us more about it now, please. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very proud to be here today to present the Allingham Award for the best short story in memory of my wonderful grandfather and beautiful writer, Jim Keane. His association with this festival goes right back to its conception in the 1980s 
And as well as being this festival's chairman for 12 years, Jim also won the Short Story Award himself on multiple occasions. In an Irish Times article, Jim spoke fondly of the Allingham Arts Festival, saying, the written word has always held a deep fascination for me. My urge to write has en was enhanced when I came to Ballyshannon and joined the Allingham Society. In my mind, writing schools, workshops and festivals such as the Allingham are a great value to any aspiring writer. They motivate, they broaden the perspective, help to improve writing and communication skills. And without their influence, I doubt I ever would have reached this level of progress with my own writing. Jim's writing and the way in which he taught me to see the world has always been hugely influential to me and my own writing and photography work. And I trust it has evoked the same feeling and inspiration in others. My family and I are very proud to have this award named in Jim's memory. Thank you, Molly. That's great. Uh, yeah, the Keene family uh, are not only well known <clears throat> here locally, but some of you may see, have seen some of the films that uh, Molly's father and mother have put together, including Gaza, uh, an Academy Award nominated documentary film, many others. Uh, it's a, we very much appreciate your contributions to the, uh, to the festival. For the fa flash fiction judge, we have invited uh, Nula O'Connor. Uh, Nula has some unique uh, credentials in this regard. She is the editor-in-chief of, uh, of Splonk, which is an e-zine of flash fiction. Uh, I would recommend it. it. It's a great read online. She has also written a number of novels, fictional biographies of extraordinary women, and short stories and poetry as well. But uh, I would, I'm delighted to say tonight to let you all know that her 2021 novel, Nora, has been chosen as the One City, One Book Award uh, in Dublin for 2022. And in terms of Irish publishing, that just doesn't get much better than that. Uh, Nula O'Connor will introduce our winning flash fiction writers and offer her insights into what makes them winners. Nula? Thanks a million, Tom, and uh, thanks everyone. I really enjoyed those poetry readings, such beautiful poetry there. Um, congratulations to all of the winners and to the people who are highly commended. And, um, you know, even to enter a competition is a, it's a, it's a brave act, I think, on the part of a writer. So I'm gonna talk a little about flash fiction first and then about these particular stories. Flash is a particular art. It's not the small sister of short stories or the embryo of a novel. It's its own form, tiny, neat, perfect. I love the fast and loose. I'm just popping in for a visit nature of flash. I love that it's a one inhale and it's down experience, much like poetry. Like poetry, the flash concentrates on one moment of grief or light or one instant when things are going awry for a character, unrepeatedly awry often, or where the solution to unfortunate occurrences shows itself. All of the entries I read for Allingham were of a high standard, but the four, the three winners and the highly commended that rose to the top, they achieved the sharp economy and inventiveness that makes good flash fiction sing. All four of these writers understand what a flash story is supposed to do it's meant to leave you a little glazed around the eyes, a little shocked or moved. These writers know that the best flash fiction is like the aftermath of fireworks. Its magic clings to us, the ears ring, the stories form ghosts through the mind at random times. And really this was the case with these stories. So in third place, we have Anne Byrne with The Weatherman. Anne lives in rural County Sligo. She studied archaeology as a mature student and started writing only in 2017. So very impressive, Anne. She was a winner of the new Roscommon Writing Award in 2020 and has been listed in various competitions, including Can Turk's Flash Fiction, the new Roscommon Writing Award in 2020, the Fish Flash Fiction Prize. And her first collection of short stories will be published this year. So that's something for us to look forward to. Her story that came third here, The Weatherman, 
I just found that when I read and didn't know who Anne was, I said, this writer has excellent eyes and ears for the colloquial. They revere and honor the local as every writer should. They also know how to use menace without overwhelming the reader. This story brims with energy and economy. The scenes are visit, vivid, and there's a, whole, <clears throat> a welcome examination of Irish tradition and the significance of old age and wisdom, which is refreshing to see in short fiction. So Anne, if you would, please unmute yourself and read your story. Thank you and congratulations. Yeah, uh, Nula, thanks so much. Delighted um, to have been picked as the third place winner. So um, the weatherman. Michael didn't think of himself as a spiteful man, but as he looked out across the rising Atlantic, beyond the bony grasping fingers of Port Macloy, to where the waters of the bay emptied into the vastness of the ocean, a voice whispered to him of things that no true islander would ever let inside his head, never mind let settle on his tongue, lest they spill out and be made true and come back upon him in a cess. He clamped his jaws together, mouth crumpling inwards like a sinkhole, and tightened his grip on the walking stick, his scarecrow body tilting to the right like a grounded shipwreck. Despite his warnings, the curs had slipped out at dawn into the still promise of a fine day. The shouts and calls of the fishermen echoing back along the shore as they'd disappeared between the blurred line of sea and sky. Behind the haze, the sun and moon had slowly danced, pushing ever further apart as the light sloped across the horizon like a chaperone. Michael had simply stood and watched as the morning bled out before him, as the fluffs of cloud unfurled like yarn into long wispy things that clung about the haloed sun and the blue of the sky deepened like a day old bruise. He told them, but they were young, the few that were left, no heed on the old ways. They'd shaken their heads, pointing to the softness of the waves and to the ghost of a sun that shimmered beyond the mist. I'm telling you, Michael had said, swinging his stick towards the sky. Look, the ring around the moon, a bad sign that, a bad sign, I'm telling you. They'd laughed, told him to settle, that the man on the wireless had promised to find a no wind, nor rain, till tomorrow at least. And they'd pushed their boats out into the silky dark and were gone. Their voices fading across the water, soft as a lullaby. He'd sat for a while on the stone wall of the castle, thought about going home, but couldn't bring himself to move. Watched as the sun began its struggle barely treading water above the clouds, felt the shift of the wind as it plucked at his cap, tugging, stirring him to his feet, buffeting him forward as he shuffled towards the shorehead. The space that stretched out before him was empty, only the waves throwing themselves against the land, casting froth, like spittle against the rocks. He took off his cap, scratched his head. Behind him, the gulls were screeching, fighting for shelter. Above him, the clouds had finally bedded the sun. The world was darkening. He looked to the heavens as the first drops of rain fell. He closed his eyes feeling the wind whip across his face, the cap a smudge of blue in his fisted hand. When he opened his eyes again, his face was already wet. Nothing more to do, he turned for home. Thank you. Well done, Anne, beautifully read. Thank you. 
Uh, our second place winner is Anne Daly with her story, Mool. Anne lives in County Meath. She completed an MA in Anglo-Irish Literature and Drama in UCD, and she previously edited short fiction for Crossways magazine, and she's currently reviews editor of Berbua Journal. Her short fiction and poems have recently featured in Drawn to the Light Press, The Honest Ulsterman and Dreich. Um, when I read Mool's, I found it a tender, sensuous, atmospheric flash that draws the reader into its world with fine details. Sunset, glazed mussels, cherries, dewy grass. This writer perfectly captures the trickiness around new love, being an intruder in a tight family and cultural acceptance. I really enjoyed the discomfort in this flash that ends on a beautifully evoked, hopeful note. So Anne, you might read Mool's for us there. Uh, unmute yourself. Thank you very much, um, Nuala. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my story is Mool. The serenity of the evening was shattered by the tinkle of Mool being poured into a bowl. I was struck by the glimmer of their shells, glazed and smooth, like the wings of a huge black moth. The brittle lips gaped open, a filament of grey hinting at the soft fleshiness within. Not for the first time on this visit, I felt the eyes of the family fixed on me. A savage kind of gleam beneath a facade of absolute civility. Ari grinned apologetically. I grabbed one, prized open the sharp edges with my fingers and gulped it, eyes squeezed tightly shut. A sensation of salt and grit oozed across my tongue and down my throat. Ari's brother laughed. Hey, voila, her mother said encouragingly in her broken English. Your first mule and not your last certanimo. Ari's father made a loud pronouncement, which I could not follow as he spoke too quickly. Her brother snorted again and a flicker of annoyance flitted across her face. The rest of the meal passed smoothly. I ate only the salad and the long crisp frit. A little red wine and I was grinning foolishly at the sky. The swirling reds and pinks of the setting sun colored Ari's cheeks with a dusky glow. Come on, she said, pulling at my sleeve. It's time to pick dessert. We creaked down the steps of the veranda and washed our feet in the long grass at the bottom of the garden making our way over to the cherry trees. The branches were blood heavy with fruit, the split seams of their patina glowing a deep burgundy. Ari threw her head back and laughed as she looped the stems around her ears, two cherries like dewdrops either side of her lobe. Do you like my earrings? She sang, twirling around, the bronze strands of her hair a silhouette of waves across my skyline. Her brother did it too, and soon we were all dancing, ears full of cherries, laughter falling like raindrops on the sleeping grass. Ari stopped abruptly. Her father was approaching, his deep voice calling her back, its ink-stained resonance as ceaseless as the encroaching night. The cherries were delicious, their brittle skin giving way under the pressure of my tooth, flooding my mouth with the sweet tartness of their juice. I felt myself dissolve, unbecoming the person I was, the person I had always been, stepping into a newness I hardly recognized. I mingled with the fragrance of bougainvillea that encircled us all with a tenderness that colored the air and draped itself over the watchfulness of her father. That night in the guest room, surrounded by the unfamiliar sounds of an unfamiliar country, I smelled the faintest trace of Ari on my pillowcase. I dreamt I was lying beneath a cherry tree, the soft grass tickling my skin. It began to grow upwards and upwards as if to touch the sky. No longer grass, but hair, russet threads binding me, encasing me within walls that were soft yet unbending. Just as the sky was about to disappear, I awoke, startled and disoriented. Through the window, the rising sun bled gently into the waiting clouds, its rose-coloured resignation, calm as the touch of lips on my cheek. Thanks very much. So lovely, thank you, Anne. 
such a beautiful piece. So we come to our first place winner, and that's Patrick Holloway with his story, 15C47662. Patrick is a writer of fiction and poetry. He won the 2021 Molly Keane Writing Award, and his work has been published by The Stinging Fly, Carve, The Irish Times, Southward, The Moth, and in other places. He came second in the Raymond Carver Short Story Contest and won the Overland Literary Journal Contest too. His first novel is currently under submission and we wish you luck with that, Patrick. Uh, <clears throat> this flash from the title, which is a car reg, snared me instantly. The writer introduces a sense of wonder in the opening sentences, then deftly unravels it to discontent and ultimately tragedy. This is elliptical work with just enough set before the reader to leave her thinking and guessing. The 13 numbered sections do good, interesting work, as does the car reg title. A cohesive flash that pulses with thoughtful, original writing. So maybe you'll treat us now to a reading, Patrick, and congratulations to you. Thank you so much, guys. I'm, I'm delighted to win and also that you chose it, Nola, because I'm a huge fan of your work as well. I'd like to thank Tom and everyone at the Allingham Festival as well, and also everyone at the Keane family. Um, I will take good care of the trophy, I promise. <laughs> um, 15C47662. One, your teeth are smudged blueberry. You hold one in between finger and thumb, examining it as if it were a world. You are the same age as me, but I feel like you have been here before. Your foot flirts with my leg under the table. It is hard to be so alive sometimes, trying to take in too much. You say something and I miss it, lost to unformed futures. Your leg pulls away. You drop the blueberry to the ground and sigh. I can see the air and something else leave your exaggerated mouth, something earthy. Two. In the moments after, your fingers are too soft, tracing veins up and down my arm. There is a rare silence to you, and I think you are happy. The thought alone speeds everything up while slowing everything down. There are a hundred of you, and only now do they move in unison, kicking two hundred perfect feet free from the blanket, all those mouths echoing so much breath against my neck. Three, your teeth grind, feet tapping the concrete as your arms swing by your side, pupils the size of blueberries. The music flees from the club and whatever we left is something already altogether different. You hold the wall and vomit splatters against your bare legs. I look down and there are so many shadows fighting for space on the gray stage of memory. Four, you bite my lip too hard and draw blood. You spit it out and say sorry and shrug as if you are not sorry. You crumple up like a sweet wrapper. Fold it into yourself, you cry, then scream when I try to get closer. A few crimson drops drip from me as I lean down and stain the carpet floor. Five, I call you, drive to the apartment you rent, call your mom. The day is enveloped in the night and opens out above me. You are gone and I tell everyone you will be back. Inside of me, there are only chambers I cannot come out from, each one a morsel of time with you. Six, a year passes. Seven, 15 more. Eight, when they find your card is because a part of the registration is still visible at the bottom of the tide, a sepulcher of silt. The smell of the car comes back to me, not the color or anything else, just the smell of pine that used to remind me of Corabini woods and how frightened I'd be on school trips there, or looking out at the trees under the moon, knowing people were hanged there back in the war. We walked there once, and I watched how your head bent so far back to take in the sheer height of the oak, 
the birch, the ash. Nine. They find no remains for the first few days. I do not talk about it much, but people text me, people I haven't spoken to in so long. My son and daughter ask me what is wrong, and I say I'm just tired, which is the best truth of a lie I can muster. Inside of me, acute edges try to fit themselves into something the shape of your eyes. At night, I cannot look at my wife. 10. A tooth, a molar, a broad surface for grinding, for breaking things down that doesn't break down. I think it must be the one from the top right of your mouth, the only one that didn't have ugly copper fillings. 11. All that time down there in the depths of yourself. 12. You were gone longer than I knew you. 13. I see you smile now, moving like a silk scarf falling from the pier. I see it ripple the surface, imbibing all the air and salt and softly drowning beautifully. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patrick. Beautiful work and beautifully read. Well done. Delighted for you. I'll hand back to Tom now. Thank you, Tom, for having me as George. It was a pleasure. Well, well thank you, Nula. Thank you, all, all the fiction writers. Uh, we have a couple of treats for you coming up. First of all, uh, let me ask uh, Molly Keene. Do you, Molly, do you have the trophy there with you? Uh, no, I do not. Um, oh, whoops, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's, um, it's... I believe it is in my home house in Donegal. Ah, well, it's a beautiful glass trophy uh, and uh, with the names of uh, previous and current winners uh, engraved on it. So uh, that's, uh, Patrick, you'll be receiving that as well. So thank you. To, to conclude our program tonight, uh, I'm going to ask each of our judges to read an excerpt from their work. Uh, Afric McGlinchey is going to read from Tied to the Wind, her new, uh, her new work. She describes this work uh, with these words. It is a flash prose poetry autofictional memoir, which I think is a fabulous phrase. And I'm very curious to hear what it uh, sounds like, and I'm very curious to read it. Uh, Afric, please. Oh, thank you, Tom. Um, that's what the book looks like. And uh, it's uh, been published by Broken Sleep Books. So uh, it's available online and in a, in a, in a few independent bookshops and also uh, from Broken Sleep Books themselves and from me actually via my website. Um, I'm going to read three little pieces from it. Um, yeah, I couldn't figure out what to call it. Uh, these days, I'm just calling it hybrid. <laughs> so, because you'll notice there's, there's lots of white space. And also, uh, so, yeah, so it's there's a lot of white space. Each, each memory is a kind of, um, kind of flash memory. So the first piece I'll read, um, I had a very nomadic life. And the first piece I'm going to read from is we're living in Zambia. And my parents have returned to Ireland. Uh, because my mother's sister was dying and we were left my brother and I were left on a farm uh, with a friend of mine Mary M Marie and um, yeah so we're about seven and six years of age this is called Black Hound Swallowed Sun I follow Marie past the sugarcane fields our tires hissing in the dirt I'm watching I'm watching the bunched hem of Marie's dress flutter with yellow and white stripes like trapped butterflies. When Ivor's high pitched voice rings out, wait for me. Sugarcane stalks stand east and west of us. I glance back over my shoulder and see a huge black shape flinging itself out from behind the sugarcane. A massive black shape leaping, a monumental black creature leaping from a row of crops, leaping out and knocking Ivor to the ground. Leaping out of the row of cane and knocking him to the ground, sinking its teeth into Ivor's bum and holding on and holding on, its foam 
mouth, teeth holding on, holding on, foam spewing, and it's shaking its head from side to side, foam flying as though, as though trying, as though trying to tear my little brother into shreds. His one long piercing scream, and then a deafening crack. Marie's father with a rifle. Ivor stares at me through a sealed, barred window, his face dirt streaked. He's in quarantine. That means he has to stay all alone in that room for two whole weeks. I'm not allowed in to say sorry for leaving him. Sorry for last night. Sorry for not looking after him when I promised. People usually die, Marie whispers, when they've been bitten by a rabid dog. Rabid. The word has a fright and a madness in it. I want Ivy to see me through the window at least, but Mrs. Walken takes me to Marie's room so I can't see them injecting him. Rocking, arms crossing my belly. It'll be my fault if he dies. When Mrs. Mrs. Walken comes in to kiss Marie goodnight, I cry for my own mother. Cry when I smell Ivor smell in my bed. The next day, through the barred window, I catch sight of the doctor flicking the huge syringe while a nurse tries to hold Ivor still. The doctor has to come and puncture deep into Ivor's belly button every day, 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 every day. He is one gutsy little boy. I hear Mr. Walken murmur to his wife. Hasn't cried once. Brutal injection. I've heard that even grown men scream. They'd rather die. Um, so, um, okay, so I've got two more. The next one is uh, in Limerick and um, we, we're, we've been living there for a few years and I've fallen in love with my Irish life, but suddenly we're told we have to move again. We're heading back to Africa this time to Zimbabwe pre-independence. So my cousin, my favorite cousin comes down from Donegal to say goodbye. Um, this is called All the Dandelions. The patio wall overlooks my field. Freya and I scrabble over it, sit cross-legged on feathery green pillows, poker dotted with unblown dandelion heads. This is her first visit to our home, and it'll be the last too. Think your dad and Beth will like each other? She nods, shrugs, looks at me, lifting her hands. Does it bother you? No. He's so lonely. Your mum is sweet to arrange this. It could work as well as anything. She's a widow too, you know, I say. Been alone for years. We grow quiet, unsure whether the same thought has twisted through us both. And then she becomes her animated self again. Apparently Indians have more faith in arranged marriages because they think Western romantic love is a come lately concept. Wonder how you recognize real love, I say, whirlpooling some daisies into a dance with wind and finger. Maybe, I say, inspired, is the way you might sense a ley line, some mystical flutter. Or maybe, you know, says Freya, when his thing doesn't repulse you. We laugh. I'm kind of with the Indians, she says. I reckon it's more of a decision you make. Bet I could marry any one of the random males we passed on the way back from the shops and the odds of it working out would be the same. The meadow tosses its head and dandelion seeds launch into the air. Words are veils, but tone is a peeling of skin. Can you imagine doing it? cross-legged, hands over ankles, shaking my head adamantly. Me neither, she said. Have you ever seen a penis? So easy to tell her about the driver lurking by the open door of his lorry. 
I had the shudders for hours. Maybe, she says, he just hopped out to have a pee and you just caught him in the act. We laugh and laugh, though I know what I saw was deliberate. Ah, oh, Freya, who's going to discuss the great questions of life with me and share my endless consternations? Though it's frightfully sad, we laugh again. All this while, I haven't been paying enough attention to how you become Irish in your head and heart, as well as your blood. And now it's too late. Have I got time for one more? I'm a bit, I'm um, not sure about time. Maybe, maybe I'll leave it at that. Give us one more, please. Oh, one more? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this last one, um, I'm, we're now living in Zimbabwe, which is pre-independence, and I'm about 17. And with all the moving, I always used to think, well, oh, how, how do I latch onto a feeling of home? And my mom used to say, home is wherever we are. Um, but sometimes even that became a little bit uncertain. So this is bolts of everything. Panting walk up the last part of the steep hill, pushing my bike, thunder and lightning jumping me every few minutes. Finally, at last, still alive, I reach our front door. Mum and Molly, whirling to Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive, top volume. Soggy and giddy at seeing my mum at like that, I feel an uprush of birds in my chest. Don't come in wet, bathroom, she points. Walk on the newspapers. As I peel off my soaked uniform, one of dad's stories about when he arrived home from the Congo comes to me. Mum wouldn't let him into the house. She ran inside, locked the door, fetched a bowl of hot water, shaving cream, razor, and handed them to him through the window. You can enter when you've removed that caterpillar from your face, she'd said. And he'd shaved there and then on the lawn. I love that story, my mother's empowerment. Mum says she did it because I was screaming in fear at this stranger, tall as a giraffe, who had been away for a third of my life. And she thought it would make him more familiar to me again. Also, she winked, she hated moustaches. If you can't see a man's mouth, you don't know what kind of man he is. Mum's stilettos changing to a sharper pitch as she approaches the bathroom. A swallow dive involves leaping into the air, feeling its flow rush over your body, flipping, then plunging into the pool. Everything is different underwater, that denser element. Sound, volume, temperature, your body somehow magnified. A pause, then the propulsion up, shaking water from your ears, a moment before reality shapeshifts again. That's how it feels when she tells me. She doesn't say where they're going or for how long. All she says is, look after your father and study hard for your exams. Then she walks out the door, taking Molly with her, leaving me behind. Thank you. Oh my, thank you so much, Afric. Wow. That's, I'm looking forward to reading the whole book. Uh, I'd like now to invite Nula O'Connor to read an excerpt from Nora, a her fictionalized biography of Nora Barnacle, who risked everything to run off to Europe with a destitute, nearsighted, and unpublished writer who stayed out too late and drank too much and lived in a world of dreams. Now, we owe Nora a great deal uh, because without her, Ulysses might never have been written. And we owe Nula O'Connor a grad debt of gratitude for bringing Nora so vividly to life. Uh, Nula, can you give us an excerpt, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I was going to read a little flash fiction first and then read a little piece from Nora. Uh, both are very short, I assure you. So this, I published a tiny collection of historical flash called Birdie last year with Arlen House. 
And um, because the piece I'm going to read is about war, I thought I'd read it first, so as not to leave you on a bum note. <laughs> it's called The Forgotten Front, and it's about World War I. By Bois de Faisan, where the pheasants squabble and rush in regal livery, lies my Jack. He fell at Fromel, and though they had slaughtered him, they say the Germans gave him a decent burial. I wonder what lies with him. My photograph at his breast, his gas mask tucked under one arm. Do his gold fillings glisten beneath the earth the way they did when he threw back his head in laughter? Sticky blue clay holds my Jack, the way our marriage quilt once held both of us. I sleep under it now in hope of this, that Jack's babe, snug in the nest of my womb, will never know the heft of a gun, the sorrow of a stupid war, or what it is to live life without breathing. Um, I conceived of Nora in the beginning, because you know the way when you start a big project, you always have ideas. I conceived it as a novel in flash. In fact, a novella in flash. And it turned into this, uh, <laughs> how many pages is it? Some ridiculous, nearly 400 page novel. Um, because obviously the Joyce story is very large. But some, uh, all of my chapters are short and some of them are tiny and they do stand alone as little flash fictions in my mind. Um, and my editor is quite happy to let me do the, that. So this little chapter is called Ireland. It's July the 16th, 1904. And Jim and Nora are together one month at this stage. She's madly in love with him. He's a little bit more reticent, though he, he is mad about her, but he won't say he loves her. But he does tell her a lot of other nice things that he finds about her. To Jim, I am Ireland. I'm island shaped, he says, large as the land itself, small as the Muglins, a woman on her back, splayed and hungry, waiting for her lover. I'm limestone and grass, heather and granite. I am rising paps and cleft of valley. I'm the raindrops that soak and the sea that rims the coast. Jim says I am harp and shamrock, tribe and queen. I am high cross and crowned heart held between two hands. I'm turf, he says, and bog cotton. I am the sun pulling the moon on a rope to smile over the Mam Turk mountains. Jim styles me his sleepy eyed Nora, his squirrel girl from the pages of Ibsen. I am pirate queen and cattle raider. I'm his blessed little blackguard. I am, he says, his auburn marauder. I'm his honorable barnacle goose. Nora, Jim says, you are syllable, word, sentence, phrase, paragraph, and page. Your fat vowels and shushing sibilance. Nora, Jim says, you are story. So that's it. Thank you. Yes. The uh, thank you so much, Nula. Uh, I can personally confirm that Nora is a wonderful read. Uh, some of those beautiful phrases come back toward the end in a most poignant manner. And if you're, that doesn't move a person, I don't know whatever will. I'd like to and beg your indulgence for another minute and a half to just give a quick cap of what's going to happen at the rest of the Allingham Festival. Tonight, there's an art exhibition that's being launched by Catherine Maga, and we'll hear a concert by the Whileaways. Tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a terrific reading by the authors, the contributors to Lockshore Lines, which is an anthology of writing about the River Urn. Uh, the Voices from Direct Provision reading, unfortunately, has been canceled. One of the principal people involved in that has, has fallen ill. Frank Shovlin will speak tomorrow about his uh, work on the collected letters of John McGahern, uh, and he's also writing a biography of that extremely fine Irish writer. We'll get to hear Stephen Ray, the actor, being interviewed by Sean Rocks and showing film clips of his different movies. Uh, and there's going to be a night of uh, serious belly laughs with uh, Seamus O'Rourke. Uh, his new show is called The Handyman. And finally, on Sunday, there will be uh, a morning uh, of crack and 
recitations and music. The gather again uh, gathering will happen at noon, uh, followed by a history hedge school with Tommy Graham in the afternoon and a choral concert at St. Anne's uh, in the evening. Thank you all very much for your contributions and for your time. It has been a real privilege to uh, bring the, uh, the awards to everyone. Thank you so much and uh, good night.